Cowboy to the City Slicker. The Old Cowboy was played by Jack Palance, and the City Slicker was played by Billy Crystal. Do you know the secret of life? The City Slicker, Mitch, said, no, what is it? And so the Cowboy said, this, and he held up one finger. Smart Alec, Billy Crystal said, the secret of life is your finger? <laughs> and the wise cowboy said, no, one thing. Just one thing. Billy Crystal asked the <coughs> obvious follow-up question. What's the one thing? Jack Allen said, that's what you've got to figure out. One thing we say today in the busy 21st century, we can't just be doing one thing. If you're doing one thing, you're slacking off. We've got to juggle two or three things at one time. We call it now multitasking, right? We admire those who can multitask. You know, those who can walk and chew gum at the same time, we're way beyond that. I saw some street entertainers last year on a mission trip who were riding unicycles, balancing a ladder on their chin, and juggling all at the same time. Or on YouTube, I saw a young man who was not only doing the Rubik's Cube with one hand very quickly, he was doing a Rubik's Cube in both hands very quickly. That's pretty impressive. We need to be doing more than one thing. And more than a Rubik's Cube or juggling and balancing the ladder on your chin, you got to admire a single mom who can work two jobs and feed and clothe and raise kids. It's amazing how people today multitask. We can't just do one thing. If we're in a meeting, we got to be answering an email. If we are jogging, we've got to be listening to music. If we are driving, it seems too often we have to be texting. This is a skill we admire and praise because when you do two things, you're more effective. And when you're more effective, you're more successful. And when you're more successful, you're happier, right? Well, maybe not. A funny thing happens on your way to a busy, multitasking, fulfilled life. It's called stress. <coughs> the stress of the double agenda. James says in James 1, 8, the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. When you are tied up in knots with stress, there is no joy. Could the cowboy have been right? Had he stumbled onto something important, something true, something biblical, is it possible that the secret of life, the secret of joy, is found not in a finger, but in one thing? The joy of single-mindedness. Do you have the joy of a single mind? Or are you all stressed up with nowhere to go? Are you frazzled, juggling, multitasking, and not ever able to give yourself into anything or to anyone wholeheartedly? <laughs> Last week, we began a study in the book of Philippians, which we've entitled Joy in the Mess. And we learned from Paul in the book of Philippians the joy is a choice. That's good news. You get to choose your attitude every day. We learn that joy is found not out of the mess, getting out of our problems. It's not found after the mess, solving them all. It's actually found in the mess because joy is not dependent on what goes on around us, not in our control, but what goes on inside of us. And you are in control of that. So joy is not found in the absence of problems. You'll never have that. But in the presence of Jesus, last week, we saw specifically the joy is found in community. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. But today we turn to Philippians 1, 12. And we're going to learn about joy in single-mindedness. Join me please in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. Paul says, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things, plural, which happened to me, that's an interesting way of looking at it, right? The things which happened to me. What has happened to him? He was arrested. He was jailed. He was shipwrecked. The things which happened to me, wow, have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains, remember he's in prison as he writes this epistle on joy. My 
chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So he talks about the things that have happened to him. But he has not lost his joy because he has perspective. Notice the things which happened to me, he says, have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Have you ever noticed how hard it is inside the mess, inside the trial, to really get a view of what God is doing? Sometimes we don't see God's hand in or during the trial. But have you noticed at the end of the trial, when it's over, all of a sudden we get this 20-20 hindsight. Oh, now I understand. I missed that flight, but on this flight I met. Oh, I understand. I went through this trial, but it deepened my faith. Oh, I get it now. I was suffering, but it has increased my trust in the Lord. Or perhaps I see now when there's only one foot, set of footprints in the second place, when you carried me. Paul does that here. He says, the things that happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. I'm in prison, chained to a guard, but I have a captive audience, and I can share Christ with three different shifts of soldiers a day. This is wonderful, he said. Now he says, some are encouraged by my chains, verse 14. But in verse 15, he says, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. Some also from goodwill. To add to all his problems, not only is he in prison, but there are people out there who are preaching to try and make it harder on Paul. Now, I remember when I was a young, idealistic Bible college student, and I was reading Philippians, and I was studying it, and I was memorizing it, and I came across verse 15, and I thought, how in the world could anyone ever preach from impure motives? And then I became a preacher. I realize that sometimes we can preach from impure motives, and now I can tell evangelists who seem to be preaching not for Christ's glory, but maybe for their own. And I said, oh yeah, okay, all have the same problem that goes on today. He says, the former, those who preach from impure motives, preach Christ through selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing you add affliction to my chains, but the latter, the good ones, they preach Christ out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then, he concludes, only that one thing, in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. That's all I care about. Here's the one thing. Christ is preached. And in this, that Christ is preached, I, what's the next word? Rejoice. And yes, I will rejoice. What is that? It's a choice. I'm in prison, folks, but I choose to rejoice in the fact that Christ is preached. So, here is the first big idea today. Joy is not found in more. It's not found in more money. It's not found in more free time. It's actually found in less. It's found not in many things, but it's found in one thing. Have you found your one thing? Paul has a one-track mind. He says, what then? Only that one thing, Christ is preached. And I can rejoice because I have a one-track mind. I'm in prison. I don't care. I can preach Christ in prison. I'm sick. I'd rather be well. But when I'm sick, I can still preach Christ. I've been betrayed. That's okay. I can still preach Christ. I'm broken. That's okay. In this one thing, I choose to rejoice. So you see from Paul's letter here, the joy comes from meaning. Paul has assigned a meaning to the things that have happened to him. He says, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. In Paul's life, he chose to look for meaning in the circumstances of his life. He didn't just have circumstances that happened to him. He saw that God was at work in the good things and the bad things. He saw that they had turned out, that God had turned them out for good. Is there meaning in your life? Are you looking for it? Or is your life just a meaningless series of accidents, circumstances, coincidences? No, God is at work in Paul's life. He recognizes it, do we? He has learned to put what happens to him into perspective. What is most important is not what happens to me, 
but how I react. And what is most important is not what happens to me, but what I tell myself it means. What do you tell yourself the things that happen to you mean? You know, if you say, I lost, I lost the job, I lost the game, you lost, that's okay. But if you tell yourself that means you're a loser, that can pass things, right? Someone hurts my feelings. I assign meaning to that. Does that mean that I am worthless? Only if you assign that meaning to it. So you don't get the healing that you pray for. You don't get the answer prayer that you want. Does that mean that God has forgotten you? It all depends on the meaning you assign to what happens to you. So what does it mean? What do you tell yourself it means? Paul says, I'm in prison. That gives me a chance to preach to somebody that I never would have got to preach to unless I was in here. So, joy comes from meaning, and actually meaning comes from purpose. Paul has a purpose in life that Christ should be preached. If you have no purpose, there can be no meaning. To the atheist, there is no meaning in life, and there can be. If there is no personal God, there can be no purpose. If there's no purpose, there can be no meaning. But to Paul, there is meaning, because he has a purpose, that Christ will be preached. He has found his one thing, and nothing else matters. I say quite often, when someone is going through difficult times, don't ask why, but ask what. Oftentimes we ask the unhelpful question, why? Why did this happen to me and not to my neighbor? Why is this happening and we're looking for meaning? And this is usually a useless question because sometimes there is no why and sometimes we won't hear on this side of eternity why it happened. But the useful question is what? So I tell people going through difficulty, don't ask why, ask what? What should I learn? What should I do? Well, in the case of suffering, circumstances, we don't ask why but what. But with choices, we should ask both what and why. We want to know what we should do, and we want to know why we should do it. We're not mindless. We have a purpose, and we should be purpose-driven. Animals don't need a purpose. But as an image holder of God, you have to have a purpose, and that will give you meaning in your life. And you know what purpose does? Purpose actually gives us priorities. It helps us sort things out. We know what is important, and more importantly, we know what is not. Do you remember the great story of Jesus when he was eating at Mary and Martha's home? Two sisters, two opposites. Martha was a multitasker. Martha was cleaning and cooking and hosting. She was a real go-getter. Mary was just sitting at Jesus' feet. Martha complained to Jesus, Jesus, would you tell Mary to get up and help me? Imagine telling Jesus what to do. There's a problem with that, by the way. But Jesus says, Martha, Martha, in the old Hebrew it says, relax. You are worried and troubled about, what's the next words? Many things. Oh, no, 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 he says. One thing is needed. You see Jesus holding up his finger and saying, one thing is important. One thing is eternal. One thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Those dishes can keep. But Mary is doing the important thing. Do you want to be full of joy like Mary sitting at Jesus' feet? Or do you want to be full of stress like multitasking Martha, complaining to Jesus about how much you have to do? If you want joy, it is never found in more. It's not even really found in less. It's found in one thing. Joy is not found in more money. Ask someone who has more than you. It's not found in more accomplishments. Ask someone who has accomplished more than you. It is actually found not in less, not in few, but in one thing. Jesus says, one thing is needed. But, City Slicker Mitch says, what is the one thing? Ah, that's the important question. What is the one thing? Let's go back to Philippians, verse 19. Paul says, for I know that this will turn out 
for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. He sees in hindsight that his jailing has turned out in furtherance of the gospel, but now he has this confidence that what he's going through will continue to turn out for his deliverance. Verse 20, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. His purpose that Christ be preached. His purpose that Christ be magnified, where? In his life. You know what a magnifying glass is, right? A magnifying glass takes what is small and makes it big, big enough that you can see it. A telescope or something similar. It takes something that is far and it brings it near. For people out there who don't know Jesus, Jesus is small and non-existent. Jesus is distant, some God who lives away up there. Our job is to be a magnifying glass, or better, a telescope, so that people can see Jesus in us. And when do they best see Jesus in us? When everything's going fine? Or when our furniture doesn't come? Or when our kids get sick, when things go wrong, people say, wow, how did they do it? Paul is in prison. And people say, wow, how do you keep your joy, Paul? Because Jesus lives in me. Joy is not the absence of problems, he says. It's the presence of Jesus. He sums it up in verse 21, a great verse. You should memorize it if you haven't already. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Paul's in prison. He's got one thing to live for. Christ be preached. Christ be magnified. For me to live is Christ. Is Paul suicidal? No, far from it. Look what he says in verse 22. If I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. We can't choose life or death. But here he's kind of speaking tongue-in-cheek. I'm hard pressed between the two. It's never good to have two things, the stress of the double agenda. Having a desire to depart and with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. I think God's going to let John for me. I think God's going to leave me here a lot longer so I can minister to you. So Christ can be preached. So Christ can be magnified in my life. Because Christ is my life. For me to live it is Christ. In verse 25, and be confident of this. I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and, keyword, joy of faith, that your, keyword, rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Hey, look, whatever happens to me, don't sweat it. I'm okay. I have my joy. I'm excited not by what's going on around me, but by what God is doing in me and through me. Here is the secret of life, the one thing that is found in this great passage. He says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You notice there that he can't lose? Either way, he says, is great. So what is the one thing for him is Christ? Joy is not found in minimalism, less things. It's not found in nothing. It's found in something. It's found in someone. It's found in one thing. And that one thing must be big enough to fill your life. God made you in His image. Ecclesiastes said He put eternity in our hearts. So our hearts ache for something that is God-sized and God-shaped. We are persons and we hunger for a person. We are eternal. We hunger for an eternal person. You can never be fulfilled, even in serving people. Serving people is a wonderful thing. It's a lot better than serving yourself. But if you consume yourself with saving people's lives through medicine, saving people's lives through policing or fighting fire, if you, if you serve people through industry, through service, that's a wonderful thing. But one day, you'll find out that that's not enough. We are to serve people because we serve Christ. We serve Christ by serving other people. For him, to live is serving Christ. Ultimately, what I really want you to do right now is I want you to either mentally, or if you have enough courage, to actually pencil in, what is it for you to live? If you were really honest,
honest with yourself. If no one was looking over your shoulder, what would you put there? Would you put, I'm afraid of today our materialistic society, too many of us would have to be, for me to live, is getting money or getting things. That is the almighty dollar chasing the buck. But if you really live for that, can you be honest enough with yourself to fill in the second blank? What then? If for you to live is money, then to die is to leave it all behind. What else might someone put in there? If you're honest, maybe for you to live is having a good time. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Okay, there are a lot of people who live their life that way. But if you're honest with yourself, if the first blank is having a good time, what's the second blank? Having it all end? Yes, every eye results in a crash. There's always consequences. Remember, there are choices. What if your desire is not fortune, but fame? I want to be known, I want to be loved. If that's in the first blank, what goes in the second blank? Being forgotten. If you put anything else in the first blank, for me to live is, the second blank for me to die is going to leave you empty. Is your one thing big enough to fill your life and carry on after your life? Is the one thing as big as God? David in the Old Testament was called a man after God's own heart. Why is that? Because he had that all-consuming desire for one thing. He wrote in Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing, you see him holding up a finger, One thing I have desired, one thing I want of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. David was a perfect man by his stretch. He was a man after God's own heart because he was a man consumed by Paul with one thing. He was a man of the New Testament. We don't even know his name. He's the man born blind in John chapter 9. Jesus heals him. They come and ask him, who was this man who healed him? He had never even seen Jesus, barely met him. But he says in John 9, 25, one thing I know. Have you seen holding up one finger? One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. I hear Christians tell me quite often, well, I could never be a witness for Christ because I never was a there, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a missionary, I'm not trained, I don't know enough to witness to somebody. You know more than this man. Here's a man, all he knows is one thing. I was blind, now I see. Jesus changed my life. Has Jesus changed your life? You can be a witness for Christ. All you gotta know is one thing. Or how about Paul? Paul himself says later in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, one thing I do. Can you see him wagging that one finger at us? I know one thing. I want one thing. I do one thing. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press for the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus said one thing is needed. David says one thing I want. The blind man says one thing I know. Paul says one thing I do. Do you get my one thing this morning? You ever heard a message where the preacher was all over the map? Run around like a chicken's head cut off and you go, oh, I wonder what that was all about. Sometimes the preacher doesn't know what he's talking about. He rambles on for a while and people don't get the one point. You need to have one point. Get to it, preacher. What is it? It's one thing. You know, I would love to fool you into thinking that I've got it all together. But I don't. That's my wife and my daughter. I don't got it all together. I'm not perfect. Some things are easier for me. Some things are harder. Some people have no struggle with temper. Some people have no struggle with lust. But everyone's got their struggles, right? One thing I don't have a struggle with is this one thing thing. A psychologist might call it OCD, but I'm pretty narrowly focused. And always have been. I don't have a problem with the one thing. I can multitask, don't get me wrong. I can walk and chew gum. I can listen to a book and drive at the same time. But I'm consumed with one thing, naturally. When I was very young, two years old, I was consumed with cars. My mom cut out an article I was 
put in the paper. Little Jeff can name every car in the year of every car on the road. At one and a half, two years old, I was consumed with cars. Then I got wiser and older, and I got consumed with Batman and Superman and the comic books. And I collected them, and I knew every color of kryptonite. And I was absolutely laser focused on Batman and Superman. And then I really got mature, and I discovered something much bigger than Batman, and that's baseball. And I collected baseball cards, and I played baseball, and I watched baseball, and I memorized baseball until I became a man at 13 and fell in love with music. And then I was laser focused on music, and I knew every song, and I wrote songs, and I sang songs, and I learned instruments. Music was a wonderful passion. It got me a scholarship in school. That's great. I could use it to serve Christ. But what I was missing out on, oh, I had the one thing down, but the one thing wasn't really big enough to fill my life. Baseball, music, Batman, never fill your life. Even serving other people in the end is not enough for the internal hope that God has created in the heart. And God got a hold of my life. I fell in love with Jesus. And now he is the passion in my heart. The one thing, and you don't have to be a pastor or a missionary to be one thing all about Jesus. You can be in prison, you can be anywhere. Do you say what Paul says, one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press for the goal, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is your one thing? Do you have one thing? If not, get it. One thing. But be very careful in picking out your one thing. Is your one thing big enough to fill your life? As a church, we are about one thing. We forget sometimes. We think as a church it's all about maintaining tradition. We think it's about the music that we like, the preaching that we like. No, actually, the one thing we're here to do, the one thing we can't do in heaven, is to reach other people for Jesus. It's the Great Commission. Great Commission is broken down into two things. I want to complicate things, but it is all about evangelism, reaching out to people, others who don't yet know Jesus. So they might surrender their lives to Christ. And discipleship, helping those who have come to know Christ to become more like Him. That's the one thing we're all about. But what's the one thing you are all about? What will you passionately spend the rest of your life? life doing? What do you focus your life on? You can take light and if you focus it, remember as a kid with a magnifying glass and the sun and a poor little ant, what you can do with focusing the sun? What does a laser do? What can you do with a pressure washer when you focus? What could you do with your life if you focused on one thing and if you focused on the right thing? What is your one thing? Will you choose something that is worthy of your life? What is your one thing? Let's pray. God, today, give us joy in focusing on you, the things that are eternal, things that matter. If there is one person here this morning who does not know you, I pray that today and all the other things in life distract us and complicate life, would melt away and they focus right now on things of eternity. We got so bad here. I suppose we're here this morning as John has already spoken to us about. It's all about Jesus. It's not about what you've done. It's about what he's done for you. Do you realize that you're a sinner, that you cannot save yourself? Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? He didn't die on the cross so that you could do good works and be saved. It's not a works. It's not what you boast. This morning, if you receive this gift by faith, God will give it to you right now where you're seated. And he'll say, to say something like this in your heart right now, the Lord, the Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I know I deserve death and hell for my sin against you. But I thank you for loving me anyway. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe you took my place. Come into my life, forgive my sins. Let me the person you want me to be. You're in so bad. You pray that prayer this morning, and you meant it. I would love to pray for you. Would you allow me to do that this morning? Maybe you step forward this morning and come up and say, I, I, Pastor, I prayed that prayer this morning. Or I mean, so I haven't yet. So I've still got some questions. I'd like you to settle that today. If you're a Christian, has God spoken to you today about one thing? Maybe your life is consumed with many things, or maybe there are
there is something consuming your life, but it's the wrong thing. It's the broad road that leads to destruction. Will you today devote yourself to the one thing that you were created for? If you're a Christian today, as we say in this last song, I invite you to step forward and pray at this altar. Lord, I want to be all about you. One thing I want, one thing I know, one thing I do, one thing that's needed is Jesus. Why don't you come and lead us, please? Let's sing, and I invite you, if you need to know Jesus, or if you need to surrender to Jesus, Make him that one thing. I encourage you. Step forward. Or right there where you're seated. You can pray, Lord.